Good afternoon, and welcome to the Safer Transportation session as part of PennDOT's first ever virtual Innovation Week. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Danielle Klinger Grumbine with PennDOT's Bureau of Innovations, and I will be your host for today's session. Before we get started, if you are a PennDOT attendee on today's call, uh, please make sure that you disconnect yourself from VPN. Um, if that means you need to leave and disconnect from VPN and rejoin, please do so now. Following each presentation today, there will be a facilitated question and answer period. If you have any questions for our speakers during today's session, we invite you to use the chat pod on the right hand side of your screen to submit your questions. We will take questions in the order in which they were received. Um, if we're running short on time and we can't get to all of the questions after a particular presentation, we'll be circling back to those questions at the end of our session. So our speakers are going to stay on the line. Um, so if there is any we don't get to, we'll, we'll get to them at the end of the session. Throughout the Virtual Innovation Week, I also encourage you to view the more than 50 innovative tools, materials, applications, and technologies that are on display in our virtual exhibit hall. And that virtual exhibit hall is located on our event website at www.pendot.gov forward slash innovations week. These innovations are being used by federal, state, and local agencies and could help you do your job safer, better, faster, and even save you money. There actually are a lot of exhibits out there from our PennDOT district offices and local governments, uh, a lot of safety innovations and uh, smart practices. So definitely encourage you to check that out. There's also a contact form on the virtual exhibit hall page that will allow you to submit any questions that you have about a particular innovation. Uh, so if you do submit some questions about one of the innovations you see out there, We'll get you connected with the appropriate subject matter expert to answer those questions. And finally, before I introduce our first speaker for this afternoon's session, please be advised that this session is being recorded. Uh, and in fact, all uh, recordings from our virtual innovation week sessions will be available on our event website within the next week or so. So if there's any that you missed from earlier this week or you want to listen to this session again, um, they'll be available on our event website. Further, if you click on the link, the participant link in the calendar invitation that you received for today's session, you'll actually be able to hear a playback of the session, and that will be available shortly after we conclude today's session. So again, if you miss any presentation um, or you just want to listen to a particular uh, one again, uh, you'll be able to click on that participant link shortly after the session ends and, and listen to it again. So with that being said, um, I'd like to introduce um, our first uh, speakers for today. We have Michael Castellano, a senior engineer with Pannoni, who works with PennDOT's Local Technical Assistance Program. And we also have Tiffany Wells, who is the traffic superintendent for the city of Bethlehem. And I'd like to welcome Mike and Tiffany to today's session. And Mike, you now have control of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Danielle. Um, and thank you for having me today. Uh, I'm representing the Pennsylvania LTAP program, which stands for the Local Technical Assistance Program for, um, for Pennsylvania. And I'm going to be talking to you today about local road safety plans. LTAP has a uh, training class on this subject, and my material today comes from, um, from that training class that is offered by the LTAP program. The purpose of a local road safety plan is to identify key safety needs and guide investment decisions um, to achieve reductions in fatalities and serious injuries. And those are really the focus of, um, of the safety efforts, both at the federal and the state level, is to reduce fatalities and serious injuries. In this case, we're talking about local roads um, for those reductions. Uh, the, the local road safety plan utilizes the four E's of safety, engineering, education, enforcement, and emergency services. Um, and the local road safety plan um, that you have in, in your community or that, that you develop in your community should um, fit within the Pennsylvania Strategic Highway Safety Plan, 
that is led by PennDOT, and also any safety plans that are at the local level, perhaps by uh, the metropolitan and rural planning organizations. Um, Danielle, did the slides advance? No, it doesn't look like they will. I'll advance them for you, Mike. Okay, I, it's, I'm having trouble, so thank you. Um, so th that second slide was just the definition. Um, if you can go back to that quickly, Danielle. So I described, you know, what what in in what I just said in terms of the local coordinated safety plan. Um, again, it should provide that comprehensive framework for reducing fatalities and serious injuries. Um, next slide, please. So local road safety plans are one of the, I think there's 20 proven safety countermeasures that, that Federal Highway Administration has um, marketed since uh, 2008. These are countermeasures that uh, nationwide have proven to provide the best safety improvements um, and have, you know, through studies have shown um, to have the biggest safety benefits um, to be applying these types of improvements on, on not only local roads, but on the entire road system. Um, you know, they're available on the internet. If you just Google FHWA proven safety measures, you'll find information about all of these. But key thing here is just to point out, we are talking about a proven safety countermeasure endorsed by Federal Highway Administration. Next slide, please. So really why we want to develop an, a local road safety plan is that you have unique conditions in your community. If, if, if you're listening today and watching today representing a local government or you do work for a local government, um, there are unique needs on a local road system that perhaps PennDOT doesn't deal with on the state system or you know, there's definitely needs on a local road system that don't apply when you're dealing with higher type roadways, interstates, other expressways um, that are important to capture in a local road safety plan. <clears throat> it can be a foundation um, for consensus and focus for your efforts. Uh, it, uh, it helps to identify emphasis areas and strategies that can impact um, local road safety. <clears throat> In coordinating the local road safety plan with the state strategic highway safety plan is also important because there can be things from the state plan um, that can definitely apply to your local road safety plan. And there can be inputs from your local road safety plan that perhaps, you know, PennDOT can use in their strategic highway safety plan that applies to Pennsylvania as a whole, you know, that can be inputs to the state plan. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits? Um, I'm going to talk about six benefits here in this slide. Um, starting at the top of the screen and then working um, <clears throat> working clockwise through this graphic. Um, it, it gives a proactive approach. Um, it allows the transportation officials to, to systematically reduce severe crashes. Um, it also helps to build trust between the public and the local officials. Um, you can develop partnerships. Um, a successful local road safety plan relies on these partnerships between the public stakeholders and governmental agencies, um, improving the relationships and, and communication between um, those different groups. Multidisciplinary coordination and cooperation. Um, you can develop more effective solutions by coordinating better among the different groups within the local agencies and the local government. And I talked about the four E's and this is where this comes in. Um, we, we can't solve our safety problems by just applying an engineering solution or just applying an educational type solution. We need all of the E's, including enforcement and emergency service strategies. And ultimately we can provide safer roadways by developing a local road safety plan. <clears throat> safety funding in terms of um, having a local road safety plan, uh, you'll be uh, better able to justify funding requests by prioritizing the list of improvements that are needed in your community. And it can also show that the local agency has done its due diligence in terms of, we've looked at all of our safety concerns, understanding we have limited funding, um, <clears throat> but you can compete more effectively 
for those limited funds um, that you might have access to. And then you can manage your liability. You know, clearly, as I just said, you don't have all the money in the world and, and all the money at your disposal to address every safety concern, um, but it can show you have a proactive approach that you're addressing the ones that are the worst or the ones that you can achieve more quickly than others, and you have a rational approach to doing that. Next slide. So what are some of the success factors that we found um, both nationally and within Pennsylvania for local road safety plans? The first thing is having a champion. Um, I think we have one of those champions and our next speaker, um, Tiffany from the city of Beth Bethlehem. Um, this is a person that, that really advocates for the local road safety plan and you know, gathers the support that it needs to see it through to successful implementation. Um, a local road safety plan should have a clear vision and mission statement so that all the stakeholders are, are united towards a common goal. You can assemble collaborative partners. Again, um, getting all the, the different partners that are involved as part of the plan is important for ensuring success. Um, allocating appropriate resources. Again, uh, different groups, when they come to the table, have different resources available to them. There might be different funding sources that um, different folks know about and can access um, and, and can create you know, different access to different funding opportunities that perhaps one or two people might not know about um, if they've, you know, uh, are dealing with um, or haven't dealt with those different, you know, partners and, and wouldn't know about them otherwise. Then you establish open communication. Um, <laughs> this is also important with community partners and citizens um, to get local input and citizen input from the general public to help um, collaborate and implement the plan. Next slide, please. So this is a federal guide from Federal Highway Administration. It's a little bit dated. It goes back to 2012, um, but the, the LTAP course and some of this material was, was taken from this um, Federal Highway publication um, that I'm showing here. Next slide, please. So that publication from Federal Highway Administration describes a six step process. And these are the six steps in this graphic from <clears throat> establishing leadership, um, analyzing your safety data, uh, determining you know, what are your emphasis areas. So you can't do everything all at one time. You need to determine you know, where am I going to emphasize my energies and my resources as, as far as which problems to, to try to solve first? Um, identifying strategies. You know, what am I going to do to, to solve those problems? What specific strategies am I going to empl in, employ? Prioritizing and incorporate, incorporating those strategies into your, uh, your plans. And then it's very important that step six at the top, always evaluate and make sure you're doing the right thing and the things you're doing are having a, a positive effect and a positive benefit. Next slide, please. And I want to thank everyone for their attention. And um, Tiffany's next going to talk about uh, kind of an implementation of a local road safety plan, uh, a vision zero effort um, in this at the city of Bethlehem. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, hello, my name is Tiffany Wells. I am the traffic superintendent for the city of Bethlehem. I'm uh, going to be discussing the city's uh, Vision Zero commitment that we've made. Um, we kind of took our local safety plan and um, committed that to a Vision Zero, um, and also how collaboration um, increases safety for uh, multimodal transportation. Okay, so so first, what is Vision Zero? Uh, Vision Zero was created in Sweden back in the 1990s. It's an active plan and commitment working towards zero traffic fatalities. Um, basically, you know, you have to accept that traffic fatalities can be prevented. That is the mindset of um, a Vision Zero plan. Um, and it, it does not just focus on vehicular traffic, it focuses on all modes of transportation. Uh, so the city of Bethlehem 
adopted their Vision Zero plan uh, back in 2016 um, by the mayor uh, who fully adopted that and put that out. Um, however, uh, the city was basically following the Vision Zero goals and strategies um, for over 20 years. Uh, the city's had a group that we coined CTAC. Uh, it stands for Citizen Traffic Advisory Committee. Uh, I, I must say there's, um, although I, I, I'm very heavily involved, but we, the city does have a champion that, that CTAC and Vision Zero group, um, Sherry Penshishin. I have to give her a lot of credit. Um, she is our champion for, um, she's in our health bureau uh, for our CTAC group. Um, so mentioning the Health Bureau, really the CTAC group is a, is a bunch of groups in the city um, and outside the city, uh, which includes the Health Bureau, the Planning Bureau, Public Works Traffic, um, our Police Traffic Unit, PennDOT, the Lehigh Valley Health no Network, and the Coalition for Appropriate Transportation. So we really found that to be successful and to have a successful local safety plan, um, which carries into our Vision Zero and CTAC, is collaboration. Um, all of these different groups that I mentioned previously are, are and we're working towards uh, reducing traffic fatalities and injuries um, and increasing multimodal transportation. Um, but this Vision Zero and CTAC group really pulls everyone together uh, to, to get the most out of it. So I'll just start at the top there for um, education, as far as education, our Health Bureau, um, our CAT, and uh, the Lehigh Valley Health Network. Uh, they really do a lot of our media outreach our health bureau takes care of a lot of the, you know, the teen driving courses, the senior driving, uh, walk to school. You know, CAT does a lot with our bicycle lessons and uh, education on, on bike riding. Um, and then moving towards the right, obviously enforcement is our police department. They're very heavily involved with us. Uh, DOI checkpoints, pedestrian education enforcement, speed enforcement, school crossings. Um, going, moving down now to um, plan and policy kind of, um, angle on it is obviously our planning department um, looking at a complete streets plan and policy uh, development improvements such as requiring bike racks on uh, new developments um, and, and they're very heavily involved with grant opportunities and then moving to the left there physical improvements which is sort of uh, that's my area in public works um, you know, physical improvements such as speed humps pavement markings uh, flashing pedestrian devices signage um, ADA improvements uh, and that so Really, all these different groups have always been doing these, but our Vision Zero plan really just ties all of them together um, and try to work collectively um, on one goal. So one of the major um, programs that's come out of our CTAC group, and, and I know they've been doing these for many, many years, over 15 years, is a pedestrian enforcement program. So this really does take uh, multiple departments to, to accomplish this. So basically we have uh, city employees um, and employees of our health network and PennDOT cross in a marked crosswalk. Uh, the crosswalks are uncontrolled, uh, so there's no signals or stop signs to stop the vehicular traffic. Uh, we typically try to do five to eight per year, and we try to spread them across the city um, to, to gather you know, data and to get the word out kind of in all areas of the city. It's obviously different traffic and, and uh, vehicular volumes. Um, so basically what we do, we, do, we cross the street, you know, we give each vehicle about a block, we walk in the crosswalk, and if the vehicles fail to yield to the pedestrians, our police department is right there with us. Uh, they go out, they pull the vehicle over, um, and then it's up to the police discretion if they write a ticket or if they just hand out um, information. And our health department did come up with a really great flyer um, just, just explaining the pedestrian laws. Um, another uh, great way that we've collaborated internally with the city, but also with many um, partners um, outside of the city uh, was a uh, walk roll LV event that we um, the city hosted. And this was in a, a partnership with the Lehigh Valley Planning Commission. Um, the city and the Planning Commission put on um, this block party to promote um, the Lehigh Valley Planning, Commitment, Planning Commission's oh, the walk roll plan, um, obviously just increasing and promoting uh, multimodal transportation. Uh, so we, we had our health bureau involved, our police department, public works, our, um, CAT, Atlanta, United Way, um, you know, many others were involved. Uh, we had the blind, uh, wheelchair bound. You know, we did bike rides around the city that were led by um, members, by our police department, by um, our coalition for appropriate transportation. Uh, so it was a really successful event that uh, we, we hope to have 
um, continue to have these every spring. Obviously this year didn't happen, but we do hope to continue to um, have these events. We really feel like it, it gets the word out there uh, to increase multimodal transportation. Okay, so just moving on to the physical improvements, um, kind of going back to uh, what what Mike had mentioned previously about um, you know proven safety countermeasures. Um, these are some physical improvements that the city has done. Um, you'll see um, we've put in some speed humps. We have both permanent and temporary. Um, I won't get into all the specifics, but uh, we do have a, a lot of areas where we have the permanent speed humps, um, and they have shown to be very successful. This location. Um, here, if you look at 2011, our ADT was uh, 1,307 vehicles. And in 2014, after the speed humps were installed, we had about 1,169 vehicles. So definitely a reduction. Um, but more importantly, the speed before the speed humps was the 85th percentile speed was about 37 miles per hour. Um, in 2014, after the speed dropped to 28.7 miles per hour. Um, so that was Definitely a great example um, of a physical improvement um, that came about from complaints and working with our police department um, and our streets department to get that installed. Uh, we also did some temporary speed humps on our main street. Um, so due to COVID, we installed planter boxes to create um, parklets for outdoor dining on our main street. Uh, actually, they were all throughout our downtowns, but this is an uh, example on our main street where we installed a temporary uh, speed hump to calm traffic. And then um, some more collaboration that's uh, come from internally with our police department and, and health bureau and discussions on, on how to make areas safer around schools. Um, the first picture is a road diet that we completed. Um, this was adjacent to Liberty High School uh, and you can see right there is the high school's football field. Uh, there were a few fatalities and serious injuries that occurred on this roadway uh, for during football games and people trying to cross the street. Uh, the city received an Arley grant to reduce the lane, to reduce the road down to one lane in each direction, and installed those flashers, so the pedestrian flashers. So that was really successful um, collaboration coming from our health bureau because um, they received a lot of complaints, and obviously working with our police department and how to get that accomplished. Um, another one was um, near schools. We we put down some pavement markings, you know, to 25 miles an hour, just to you know increase safety around the school. And then moving to the right, uh, this actually came out of an LTAP study. Uh, the city had, had an LTAP study done on about four intersections uh, a few years ago uh, that intersections that had some high crash rates. Um, one of the suggestions was to increase traffic, or I'm sorry, increase safety at this intersection was to install larger stop signs, the bright sticks, um, you know, the additional sign underneath that says cross traffic does not stop. Uh, so the city did take those LTAP suggestions and made those physical improvements. And, and we have seen um, reduction in crashes there. So that was another great example of um, collaboration with LTAP, uh, but also our, obviously our police department with the with the crashes um, and, uh, and public works. So I think that just about wraps up my presentation and thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you, Mike. We do have some questions here. So I'm going to start here. The first one is uh, is LRSP a Pennsylvania effort or a national effort? Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I'll, I'll take that one. I, I would say it's both. Um, like I said, it's it's definitely promoted by by Federal Highway Administration in terms of the um, the proven safety countermeasures that I showed, and then the um, the document from from 2012 that talks about developing safety plans, and then uh, you know definitely Pen Pennsylvania DOT and and the LTAP program in Pennsylvania. It's it's you know definitely promoted and supported by by PennDOT, uh, and we're we're encouraging it from the LTAP um, center in terms of. Um, the training we offer and, and this presentation and, and, and efforts like that. Thank you. Next, how does winter maintenance, aka plowing, deal with the permanent speed humps? Okay, yep, I'll take that one. Um, yeah, we, we've actually haven't had too many issues with that. Um, we have steel blade 
uh, plows and um, you know we do the Seminole County speed hub so it's more like a, a plateau um, we really have not had many issues with the permanent uh, speed humps. We are going to be removing the temporary speed humps before snow, and I should have mentioned that we are not going to be leaving the temporary ones out. Um, but the permanent ones, we really have not had any issues. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next one. To be clear, under PA Title 75 SS 3542, when traffic control signals are not in place or not in operation, the driver of a vehicle shall yield. Too many people believe you must stop by law. How are you specifically educating for this provision of the motor vehicle code? If you need me to reread anything, let me know. I'm, I'm assuming that's in relation to stopping for a pedestrian. Um, you know, I, I don't have a, a great answer for that. Um, you know, we we uh, as we understand the law, um, if a pedestrian is within the crosswalk, uh, the driver has to yield. Um, our police department does use discretion. You know, um, if if we had just stepped out into the crosswalk, they don't they're not going to pull somebody over if they don't slam their brakes and stop for us. It's really if we are in the middle of the street and the driver goes completely around us as we are you know, approaching the double yellow line. Um, so that's that's interesting and we'll have to maybe follow back on that question. Thank you. Next, can we get a copy of the flyer on the pedestrian laws that you spoke of quite highly? Or is it out there on the internet somewhere that are linked? Um, I think this is in relation to the flyer that gets handed out at our um, pedestrian education that the that the police hand out. We can certainly um, add that as a link. I, our health department, I think, has a PDF or fly, that, of that flyer. Uh, we can certainly circle back and have that added um, later today or, or next week. Thank you. Yeah, that could be a follow up item. Thank you. OK, I do we have we might have time for another question here. Um, about, you know, what's the biggest challenge or obstacle faced by the city of Bethlehem in carrying out your Vision Zero plan? Okay, so I think the, we, we really have two big, big struggles. The first, obviously, is buy-in. Um, I mean, Vision Zero is aiming towards zero traffic fatalities and death, and there's many, understandably, who feel like that is just not an accomplished accomplish full goal. Um, so I think really getting getting buy in and having um, folks understand that, yes, you know, we can reduce and we can prevent um, accidents that that is difficult to, to change the mindset um, of, of certain people. Um, the second really would be funding. Um, we we have all these grand goals and objectives and projects that we would like to happen, but the, the funding often isn't there. Uh, so that's why we look to you know the early grants. Uh, TASA grants, uh, the multimodal grants. So we, we've applied and have been successful with qu uh, quite a few of them, but uh, really it's just constant applying for grants to try to make some of these projects happen. Thank you. Last question here for Mike. What is the best way to get started on a local road safety plan? Any tips? Well, I would, I guess I would encourage folks to, um, you know, to look into the LTAP class or to, to inquire about, um, you know, where it's where it's going to be offered next or, you know, offer to host it in your in your jurisdiction. Um, and that's a that's a half day class. It's a four hour class to learn about it, learn about local road safety plans and um, to, to help you start, you know, applying some of the, the concepts that we talked about. I think that's, um, you know, probably one of the best ways to, to go about it. You know, there's those web. Uh, the FHWA website, I think, is a great source of information. Um, you know, just Google FHWA proven safety countermeasures, and that that screenshot will will come up after a couple clicks. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is there's um, there's Vision Zero cities elsewhere in Pennsylvania, not only Bethlehem, um, Philadelphia is a Vision Zero city, as well as Harrisburg. The city of Harrisburg is. Um, and, and Vision Zero is not the only way to go about it. It's just kind of one one form of 
of how you develop a local road safety plan. You know, you don't have to call it Vision Zero, but um, you know, we do have the statewide goal of of reducing um, you know, the zero fatality goal is is in the is in the state strategic highway safety plan. So that would be something to you know logically adopt at the local level. All right, that's all we have time for. Thank you both for your time. Thanks, Crystal Ann. Um, thanks to, to Mike and Tiffany. Um, I actually do have a question. Tiffany, you had mentioned uh, a, a few minutes ago about Arley grants. Um, for those that might not be familiar with the Arley grants or, or what those funds can be used for, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, I, I apologize. Um, yeah, the Arley is the Automated Red Light Enforcement Grant. Um, um, by, and by no means am I an expert on that, but i um, just been through the process. Uh, we've used it for the road diet um, and just increasing pedestrian safety and adding the uh, flashers, the, the, the pedestrian flashers. So um, that is a grant I think available for um, signal type or the flashers or, or pedestrian type safety. Um, I think it is geared more towards signals maybe, but um, certainly can be used. Like I said, we used it for those flashers to be installed. Thanks, Tiffany. I appreciate that. Again, my thanks to you and Mike for your presentation today. Again, just as a reminder, if you do have additional questions for Mike or Tiffany, again, use that chat pod on the right hand side of your screen. Um, if we do get additional questions in for, for Tiffany and Mike, we'll circle back to those toward the end of the session. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker today. Uh, his name is Jeffrey Roker. He's the Senior Traffic Control Specialist in the Highway Safety and Traffic Traffic Operations Division under PennDOT's Bureau of Maintenance and Operations. Just a quick programming note, um, Jeff actually has two presentations today, one on the Highway Safety Network screening and then the other on the Pennsylvania Crash Information Tool. So we're gonna listen to um, both of Jeff's presentations here uh, before we move on to, to a speaker after uh, Jeff uh, Pierce. Uh, so I, at this juncture, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Jeff and welcome him to today's session. Jeff. Thanks, Danielle. Good afternoon, everyone. Yep, I'm gonna, like, I, like Danielle said, I have two presentations and I'm gonna start off with our highway safety network screening process. Okay, well, I'm just, we're on the right slide now, so I'm just gonna start off with this first one here. Uh, I'm gonna start off with some general methods to, for safety analysis weigh the differences between observed versus predicted methods, as well as present what some other states are doing, and then go into some more detail on our Pennsylvania network screening site analysis. The Highway Safety Manual Implementation Pooled Fund Study uh, developed this scale and scope of safety assessment methods document to help transportation professionals select safety assessment methods at each step of the project development process, this guide shown on the screen here can be accessed online and I'm going to reference it throughout the presentation. Next slide. Using historical crashes can be very relevant and useful in evaluating the recent safety performance on existing facilities. We generally use the most recent five-year time period for observed crashes. However, using only historical crashes becomes less relevant in estimating the future safety performance, uh, especially when traffic conditions change or uh, we implement a safety project at a specific location. Observed crashes could be relatively useless when the type or the character of the roadway changes, or in the case of a newly constructed bridge or a roadway, uh, we might not even have any historical data in those cases. 
So there is a need to select the appropriate safety assessment method, uh, specialized projects and situations. Next slide. Here we see some of the limits of using only observed data. There is a variability in crash frequency and severity, as you can see here in the charts. Uh, it's isolated to just that individual location, and it doesn't account for changing site conditions. Next slide. So for, for many years, uh, we used crash rate, and that has been the most common measure of safety. Crash rate equals the number of crashes per million vehicle miles. And it looks like we're still waiting for that slide to catch up here. Okay, there we go. If you can, can you move on to the next slide? Okay, the Colorado example. This data is courtesy of Patricia Welshberg from the Montana Department of Transportation. Here we have a corridor just west of Denver, Colorado. Gambling was introduced here in 1992. You can see the accident counts and the ADT before and after multiple casinos opened in this area. Crashes increased significantly, but the average daily traffic increased as well. Next slide. And next slide. Okay, so before gambling, the average crash rate was 2.26. Next. After gambling, the average crash rate dropped to 1.23. Next. The highway alignment and the typical cross section have not changed at all. After the introduction of gambling, the percentage of crashes involving alcohol increased by 500%. Next. So the question I'd like to pose is drinking and driving plus gambling good for highway safety? Of course, the answer is no. Uh, what we saw here was the traffic volume increased due to the casinos opening in the area and dramatically changed the crash rate. So this is a good example of why crash rates are not a good metric for judging highway safety. Next slide. So with that said, how can we improve highway safety assessments? Let's use the highway safety manual. Next slide. Uh, so with that said, what is the network screening? A safety network screening is reviewing a transportation network to identify sites based on potential for reducing average crash frequency. Chapter four of the highway safety manual has a summary of network screening options. Table 4-1 shows the data and input needs for each performance metric. And I'll show this on the next slide. Pennsylvania currently uses the excess method with EB adjustments. 
Next slide, please. Okay, so here we see that chart. Uh, this table can be found on page 16 of the FHWA Safety Assessment, Assessment Methods document. While using crash rates and frequencies have been popular in the past, the next edition of the Highway Safety Manu Manual, which is expected to be released uh, next year or in 2022, will not have the first four measures here shown in this chart and pretty much include only predictive methods. Most states have adopted the level of service safety or some other, or some other method that we are using. Uh, excess crash frequency with EV adjustment is the one that we're using there shown, highlighted at the bottom. Next slide. Okay, well, uh, if we can't get to the next slide, I'm just going to jump ahead here a little bit in my presentation. Um, our network screening is divided into two distinct facilities. We have both intersections and segments. In addition to the safety performance functions and ADT, Segments account for passing zones, shoulder rumble strips, driveways, intersections, and curves. Classifying an area as urban versus rural is subject to the roadway characteristics, surrounding population, and land uses, and is at the user's discretion. In the Highway Safety Manual, the definition of urban and rural areas is based on the FHWA guidelines, which classify urban areas as places where the population is greater than 5,000 persons. Rural areas are defined as populations with less than 5,000 persons. Each one of our counties on average has about 120 segments, which are divided into urban and rural sites. Some of our counties due to the demographics may not have any rural or urban locations or very few. Philadelphia, for example, does not have any rural locations, just as Cameron County up in the Northern region of our state does not have any urban locations. The segments are exclusive to state-owned highways and includes SPFs with the traffic data and dependent variables. To establish, to establish our segment locations, we had to modify our cluster parameters for each county, which varied between 3 and 12 crashes per 1,000 feet. Okay, it looks like we have the uh, PowerPoint back up and running. You can uh, go back a few slides there. Yep, back to the segments right there. Next one. There we go. We had to filter out intersection crashes since they have a completely separate screening. We determine if a highway is rural or urban based on municipality classification. And that will be changing, by the way, in our next round of network screening as we switch to using the U.S. Census boundaries. Uh, we had to determine the cluster crash amounts to get an average of 120 locations per county. And segments were extended to eliminate partial curves. And we also merged primary and secondary segments together. As for the intersections, each county on average has about 160 locations. They were also split into rural or urban tabs. And certain counties did not have any locations due to the demographics, just like the segments. Again, Philadelphia has no rural areas, no rural intersections. Uh, intersections can be divided into state to state roads or state to local roads, but they must include at least one state road. State to local intersections required additional traffic volumes to be collected, which I'll discuss more on the next slide. 
And just like the segments, the intersections include safety performance functions with ADT and dependent variables. So for the local road data, we needed to collect ADT for most of the sites as we did not have it ready-made. 2,261 local highway counts were necessary across 900 and, or I'm sorry, 694 municipalities. Each PennDOT district was provided a list of intersections where traffic volumes were being collected. And we received many inquiries from the municipalities regarding the counts, asking for more details and if they can have access to the data. Uh, as far as the filtering method for the intersections, similar to the segments, we had to modify the clusters uh, to three, at least three or more crashes within a 250 foot cluster radius from the center of the intersection. We had to determine if the highway was rural or urban based on the municipality classification. The crash amounts were cut off to get an average of 160 locations per county. And the locations were evaluated to determine specific intersection type, proper safety performance function, which required combining and splitting and even eliminating certain intersections based on critical parameters. We also evaluated predicted values and sorted them to compare locations with the highest safety potential. Next slide. Okay, so here we see a, uh, a visual representation of our network screening on a map. This is the statewide view of what the network screening looks like. And we customized the color schemes so that the locations with the highest safety need display in red and orange. So basically they just jump out at you right away. And then the green and yellow areas have smaller excess values. Yep, go ahead, next slide. As we zoom in on the map, you can see that urban intersections are a hollow dot, whereas the rural intersections are a full circle. The urban segments are a solid line, and the rural segments are a dotted line. And then once you click on a specific facility type, more details for that location will display, including the speed limit, the ADT, the number of observed crashes, uh, the excess value. We did have, uh, so we were very happy with our first round of network screening lists, but they did have some limitations, as most things do when you do it the, for the very first time. Uh, most of those limitations will be addressed in our next round of network screening, which is uh, actually underway right now. We hope to have that finalized some point next year. But as for some of the limitations uh, for the first round, they did not exclude, they did not include roundabouts, ramps, and freeways since Pennsylvania did not have safety performance functions or calibration factors at the time for those highway facilities. The total crash frequency was included only. We did not include SPS specific to just fatal and injury crashes, which in a lot of cases is preferred. Uh, the segments were not, or I'm sorry, the segments were based on primary or secondary sides, but not both. And there was also a very tight intersection spacing uh, that was required for further analysis. And the intersection related crashes outside of 250 feet were not included in the analysis. Some of the benefits of the network screening, the locations have helped select highway safety improvement project sites. This is our federal funding source for safety improvements, as well as the um, low-cost safety improvement projects, which is a $10 million pot of funding in as far as state funds that we receive each year for low-cost safety improvements. We refer to these county reports when providing design project crash analysis. 
they should be used in place of homogeneous comparison to crash rate, as I mentioned earlier. They provide a fair comparison of locations based on crash data, facility type, operations and geometric data, and they do, they do not favor locations with more exposure. So basically all 67 counties across the Commonwealth have many candidate locations and not just the urban areas with the highest ADT and observed crashes. Full election results from all 67 counties will, will be in good shape there. <laughs> and that's basically all I have. Um, I think I saw there was no questions at one point, but I guess we'll open up, up to more questions now. Yeah. Hello, so I'm not seeing any questions coming through the chat feature at this time. Um, and it looks like. Even though I'm supposed to be sharing, I don't know. Yeah, you know, work. Did the slides disappear for you as well? No, I'm still seeing them. OK, good. OK, so I think the version of the PowerPoint I have, because I'll keep keep moving here, um, is. Has it out of order? It's the older version, so I have Jeff's slides next. Is that OK to to kind of go back to or I could skip ahead and then come back to Jeff's? Well, I had actually two presentations back to back, so that, I think that's okay. right. If you move on to the next presentation, if there are no questions. OK. Yep, there we go. Um, do, do you want me to try to control this one or we'll just keep going? Let's the way we were just doing keep, it? keep going. There we go. And then okay. obviously more questions come in. Oh, no PowerPoint is showing on our end. OK. OK. So Chris, I think I'm going to try. I'm going to try sharing again. Okay. Um, if we can get it to work this uh, again here. Uh, so just stand by for a second. I'll stop sharing. OK, well, I guess I'll get started here on my next presentation. This includes certain GIS tools that we use in the department, as well as our Pennsylvania crash information tool. And the first uh, tool that I'd like to discuss is the uh, PennDOT video log. And this can be accessed through our PennDOT homepage, our PennDOT website. Uh, also, many of our JS applications have hot links to this application, or you could just simply do a, a Google search for PennDOT video log. And so the very first step here that you'll need to do is select the area of interest. Uh, you can select by county, route number, a specific route segment. Oh, can you go back there? OK, uh, you can do uh, an intersection, more localized level there, a specific street name, zip code, uh, an entire municipality, um, certain ad street address mm -hmm. or latitude, longitude. Next slide. Um, once you select that specific area of interest on the map, it will display similar to the network screenings that I went over in the last presentation. And it will be highlighted in red there. Uh, and similar to the network screening locations, once you click on that specific location, that's that's okay. You can go ahead to the next slide. 
uh, a more more additional details will come up. Here you have some basic info for that specific location, uh, including the route number, the segment, the offset, the latitude, joint longitude. And then you can also click on, yep, the next one there is uh, some more admin data, including the municipality name, the, uh, the, the name of the street, the direction, whether it was an urban or rural area, and the divisor type. You have some additional information, such as the average daily traffic, truck percentage, uh, the speed limit at that specific location, some roadway data, including the pavement width, uh, width for the right and left shoulders. Next slide. Now, this is where the application gets really cool. Uh, so at central office, we often don't have the time or the ability to go out in the field and analyze locations. Um, and I know a lot of our districts have the same limitations. So PennDOT Video Log is very nice because you can go to a specific location and bring up the uh, a video of that location as it looks like out on the roadway. Um, and you can actually click on the play button there and it'll start driving along the roadway for you. Um, that actually won't work. That's just a screenshot, but just um, the application will move forward and you can go in slow motion or at a higher speed. Yep, next slide. The next tool I wanted to get into is our crash data retrieval, crash data analysis retrieval tool or CDART for short. And this is an application that I manage and I teach the classes for. We uh, have roughly 500 users, CDART users across the state. Uh, it is an intranet application, so you have to have a CWAPA account and be connected to the PennDOT network. And it's available to uh, PennDOT central office, district and county personnel, as well as our state police and metropolitan and rural planning organizations across the state. The very first step is to select your area of interest. And once you do that, you, you can, yep, you will choose your primary indicator, your crash flag. We have roughly 70 or so flags to choose from, and they are separated into specific categories such as crash events, road weather conditions, driver person factors, uh, the vehicle type, or the severity of the crash. After that, you'll choose your um, time period. We have, we can go back up to 20 years of data to choose from. And you can query up to all the way to just one specific day, uh, three year time period, five year, whatever you need to. And then once you choose your time period, you'll choose your output type. And we have here we see 12 different reports to choose from, as well as six different maps. Um, and then now I'll get into our Pennsylvania Crash Information Tool, PSIT. This is basically our a public version of CDART. It's an internet application and can be accessed to anyone, any member of the public. We developed this application about five or six years ago, and it's currently being, yep, that's the right one. Uh, you can go on to the next slide. So as I said, it's open to the public. Uh, we also have credentialed access for our planning partners, uh, state and local police, contractors, engineering firms across the state, our highway safety liaison officers, as well as our CTSPs. And you'll see a general theme here. Uh, basically, with all our most of our applications, you uh, there's a query tool, and you choose your analysis type, the area of interest. You'll choose the date range, um, filter characteristics, the primary indicators, and the crash flags. And then you'll also choose your output type. We can choose a table, a point map, uh, heat maps, which are pretty cool to choose from, 
or a crash history report. Uh, one of the things, if you don't have a specific area of interest that you want to select, uh, you can also do a location by a map. And this will basically bring up a, a map of the entire state. And you can choose a, you can click on that map and choose your area of interest that way. Uh, the first option, geographic selection there, is to choose by a point. You can do uh, a specific point, an intersection cross. Um, we also have the ability to do a intersection circle. You'll choose your buffer distance. You can do a straight line. You can do a freehand line. You can choose from one point along a state route to the next one. You'll have the ability to do a circle. You can just draw a circle on the map and get all the crashes within that circle. And you can always choose the uh, area unit. You can choose by a polygon. Nope, you're going a little too fast there. Um, a polygon, a freehand polygon, a rectangle, and you, your area unit, you can choose by acres, square feet, miles, meters, kilometers, whatever, whatever you desire. And then the last option there is by regions. And you'll have the ability to choose by PennDOT Engineering District, the uh, counties, or the all 2,000 or so municipalities across the state. Um, any questions on PSIT or any of our yeah. other GIS tools? Thank you, Jeff. The uh, We do have a question in, and I think it might have been related to your first presentation, came in right around our transition time. Is the network screening map accessible to MPOs? Yes. Yep. It's accessible. Um, so we do have access to CDART for our MPO RPOs and uh, network screens can be accessed through CDART. They can also be accessed through our PenShare or OneMap applications. Thank you. So, yep, all 24 MPRPOs definitely have access to those. That's all the questions that came in so far. If any others come in at the end, um, I'll be sure to to let you know when we get to the get through all the sessions. OK, sound good. Thank you, Jeff. Excellent, and thank you, Jeff. Um, again, my apologies, everyone, for the technological issues that we're having today. Thank you for hanging in there, sticking with us. We certainly appreciate it. Um, so like Crystal Ann just said, uh, certainly feel free to continue submitting your questions for Jeff, uh, Mike or Tiffany. Um, so at this point, we're going to move on to our next presenter. Um, our next presenter is Pierre Sue. He is a senior civil engineer in the Highway Safety and Traffic Operations Division under PennDOT's Bureau of Maintenance and Operations. And we'd like to welcome Pierce to today's session. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about our TISMO maps in PennDOT One Map. Uh, so a little background on TISMO. TISMO is uh, transportation system management and operations is a set of integrated strategies used to optimize operational performance of existing infrastructure without adding capacity. Uh, Danielle, did you give me control or are you controlling it? OK, um, yeah, so uh, PennDOT has developed a series of documents related to TISMO policy and implementation, and everything can be found on uh, PennDOT's TISMO website. Uh, some to point out is uh, the strate strategic framework, which makes the case for why TISMO is needed in Pennsylvania. Uh, the program plan outlines the needs, strategies, and actions for advancing the TISMO program. And our TISMO Guidebook Part 1 planning, which is uh, our publication 851, uh, provides a clear connection between planning processes, such as the congestion management process, 
the long range transportation plan, our regional operations plans, and our transportation improvement program. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the Federal Highway Administration recognizes uh, six uh, sources of congestion, and those are uh, physical bottlenecks, <clears throat> traffic incidents, inclement weather, work zones, uh, poor traffic signal timing, and special events. <clears throat> so PennDOT's goal for traffic operations are to address those sources of congestion by uh, mitigating recurring congestion, maintaining mobility during planned events, and minimizing the impacts of unplanned events. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so one tool we're using to address congestion is uh, PennDOT One Map. Uh, PennDOT One Map is a GIS visualization portal and provides an interface for showing sets of map data, which can be exported and queried for attribute data. Uh, this this application gives users the ability to query various data sets of GIS data and visualize them on a map. Um, users are able to filter layers, theme layers, intersect layers, uh, view data tables, import outside data for uh, creating temporary layers. <clears throat> uh, you can print maps to PDFs and also incorporate some outside tools such as uh, Google Street View and PennDOT Video Log. Uh, so one map brings in a bunch of various data sources from across the department. Um, these sources include our RMS roadway management system, MPMS uh, multimodal project management system, BMS, the bridge management system, RCRS, the road condition reporting system, and TSAMS, our traffic signal asset management system, which also includes the uh, ITS devices inventory. Next slide. So we created three TISMO system maps to align with the department's goals for traffic operations. Uh, we created a map focused on mitigating uh, recurring congestion, a map focused on maintaining mobility during planned events, and a third map focused on mitigating impacts of unplanned events. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so this is uh, just a screenshot of uh, our recurring congestion uh, map. <clears throat> and this focuses on our traffic signals and bottlenecks. Uh, can you go back one? Thank you. Um, some layers of uh, uh, note on, on this map. Uh, we have our INREX bottleneck rankings, and those are calculated from uh, probe speed data. Uh, we have our uh, roadway tiering, which is uh, calculated with ADT and truck percentage. Um, we also have our TomTom -tom travel time ratio, also calculated using uh, probe speed data. Um, we have uh, some our uh, volume to capacity ratio and our ITS assets and traffic signal locations. Uh, next map. All right, so this is our another uh, screenshot showing the, uh, the planned events, uh, which focuses on uh, work zones and special events. So some, some layers of note on this map is uh, we have the, the TIP in development, active, future, and complete. Um, also have RCRS layers for road work and special events, and also includes ITS assets. Next slide. Um, so this is another screenshot showing the uh, unplanned events, uh, that's our uh, traffic incidents and inclement weather. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the layers on this map um, focuses on, uh, we have RCRS layers for incidents, hazmat response, and flooding. Um, 
includes uh, some crash clusters for rear end, snow and ice related, curved road, and heavy truck. Uh, we also show our locations for our road weather information systems and uh, existing safety improvements locations like uh, guide rail and rumble strips. Uh, next slide. So I mentioned our uh, regional operations plans earlier, and or we call them uh, ROPS. Uh, so the ROPS complement the TISMO program and are developed in accordance with guidelines set out in our Pub 851. The uh, regional operations plans are used to prioritize and fund TISMO capital projects and studies as part of the transportation improvement program. So the, uh, the state is broken into four regions, each of them based around our regional traffic management centers. And each of those uh, traffic management centers will develop a ROP. Um, so the, uh, the central region there based in uh, Clearfield completed theirs 2018. The western region out in uh, Bridgeville was 2019. Uh, we just finished the uh, the eastern region based in Harrisburg uh, earlier this year, and the southeastern region is in progress for theirs. Uh, regional operations plans will be updated on a four-year cycle. Uh, next slide, please. So the, uh, the ROP development consisted of three rounds of stakeholder meetings. Um, the first round looked at our TISMO system maps and the goal was to locate areas of congestion. Um, the second round, we, uh, we focused on the uh, congested areas from uh, the first meeting and the goal was to identify the causes of that congestion. Um, the third round was to apply TISMO strategies to mitigate the identified congestion and come up with a list of projects for inclusion on the ROP. Um, the, uh, the Eastern Region ROP was in the process of being developed when COVID restrictions came into effect uh, earlier this year. Uh, so we were un unable to continue with our in-person meetings. Um, so we had to uh, adapt to remote meetings on Microsoft Teams, but uh, we were still able to maintain a high level of stakeholder involvement, which was, which was great. Uh, next slide. Um, so from the TISMO maps, we could determine the causes of congestion for an area <clears throat> and use that information to decide which strategy is applicable using the TISMO solutions matrix. Uh, this matrix and more details for each strategy can be found in uh, Pub 851, and that's uh, you can find this on our uh, PennDOT website for TISMO. Next slide. All right. So <clears throat> at our third ROP stakeholder meetings, a list of projects were created and prioritized based on the discussions from the uh, the previous two stakeholder meetings. So on this slide, it uh, might be kind of hard to see the writing, but um, <clears throat> this is an example of a project from the uh, Central Region ROP, and this project is for an integrated corridor management project. And uh, through the uh, <clears throat> Central Susquehanna Valley Thruway, so you can see on the map, there are some congestion issues from the high travel time ratios and NRICS bottleneck data. Um, and it is in proximity to a heavily sig signalized corridor. So from the, the data, a project was created for the ROP that addresses the traffic signal corridor uh, with controller upgrades and command control functionality, as well as CCTV traffic cameras for situational awareness. Um, so some potential new layers that we're looking at uh, in the, the future are <clears throat> congestion uh, performance measures like the uh, level of travel time reliability and the truck travel time reliability. Uh, also looking at adding uh, 
uh, weather and flooding data to assist planning for unplanned events. <clears throat> and we're also looking at adding some multimodal data to promote fewer single occupancy vehicles. And that is all. Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes. Thank you, Pierce. All right, a question here. In the PCIT, can you search by person? So kind of wondering, is the per person search functioning in the PCIT uh, and the, the filtering under there? I believe this is a question for Jeff, actually. Jeff, are you still there able to, to talk a little bit about that? The person search functionality within PCIT. If not, we can flag this one and, and get an answer as a follow up. And then Pierce, I do have a question for you. Can anyone access the TISMO and the one maps? Is that open to everyone? Uh, so most one map layers are available to the public, um, but uh, the TISMO layers are restricted because some of the uh, confidentiality of crash data, um, the congestion data within the TISMO maps, we, we can make that available to, to the public. Thank you. All right, that's all the questions we have at this point. All right, thanks, Crystal Ann. Uh, my thanks to Pierce again. Folks, if you have questions for any of our speakers today, uh, continue to enter them into the chat pod on the right hand side of your screen. I will uh, look to circle back to any additional questions uh, following our last uh, presentation. So that brings us to our last speaker for today's session, who is Brian Smith. He's the district traffic engineer in PennDOT's District 1. So I'd like to welcome Brian to today's session. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Danielle. Um, let's, uh, let's be thankful that we're to the last <laughs> presentation for the day. Um, hopefully I can uh, get, through this, get through it without too many technical difficulties, but um, it's a short presentation just to let everybody know. Um, so sequential lighting chevrons, that's, that's the topic. Um, I, I just want to let you guys see a, a really small project we completed up here in the district. Um, it's, well, I guess what I can say is there's, there's a bigger project, um, involving this sequential chevrons in Pittsburgh right now. I think they're looking at like 200 signs. This particular one is only seven. So it was a, a nice small project for us to start out with uh, and hopefully work out some of the bugs with the system and maybe expand on it in the future. Um, but having said that, um, just, just to talk about the title a little bit, Chevron's, you know, anybody that is on this call is familiar with what chevrons are. The lighting is just a series of LED lights around the sign. And the idea of that is just to draw a driver's attention to the sign and hopefully get them to understand the message that we're trying to convey. Um, the sequential in that title is just the manner that the lights are gonna flash. So you could either do it sequentially or you could do it like a simultaneous flash. So simultaneous would be that all the chevrons in the curve flash at the same time. But what we've done is the sequential. So as you come into the curve, the first chevron flashes, and then in sequence, they go throughout the curve. Okay, next slide. So where is this? Where do we do this? District one is in the northwest, the extreme northwest corner of Pennsylvania. Um, we have the shore shoreline with Lake Erie. Um, the, the major 
populated area, of course, is the city of Erie. And you might also notice if, if you're not familiar with this part of the state, there's a little piece of land that jets out into Lake Erie. That's Presque Isle State Park. And um, I didn't know this until I did a little research for this presentation, but there are 120 state parks in Pennsylvania, and Presque Isle State Park is the most visited. In 2019, there were 3.7 million visitors. So there's, there's a lot of people coming up here to visit the lake and the park. Uh, and the reason I, I bring that up is the contrast between that area, that park, and just a few miles to the east, the intersection of Route 86, uh, Interstate 86, and Interstate 90. Um, the, the ADT, which I'll get into a little bit later, is it's only 10,000 on Interstate 86. Um, it's Interstate 86 runs along the southern, pretty much the southern border of New York and Pennsylvania. It's called the Southern Tier Expressway. And it's, it's hundreds of miles long in New York. When it gets to Pennsylvania, it's only seven miles from that border to the junction with I-90. So that's the, the section that we're, we're talking about here. Um, next slide. So this is just a Google overview of that curve. Um, to the right, of course, is New York. And you can see you cross over I-90. And it's just a, it's really a sweeping curve. Cars can actually travel 60 or 65 comfortably around that curve. Um, trucks are the ones that have given us problems. Next slide. Okay, so this, I just wanted to give you a, a visual of what you see coming into the curve. Um, I said earlier that it's seven miles from New York, uh, but this first sign, and I'm gonna go from left to right here. The first sign is about a mile out, uh, and it's telling you in the next mile, you're gonna have to make a decision. Do you wanna go east or west on, on 90 to either of those destinations? This one's just a little further ahead where the exit ramp starts for the eastbound um, direction to go on 90. And the third one over is where the um, that eastbound ramp is, is now going to leave mainline 86 and take you on to I-90. The left two lanes are, are um, what you would be in if you want to continue to go west on 90. And both lanes continue through the curve that's up ahead. Something else I want you to notice here is we do have advanced truck rollover signs. Uh, you can see this one adjacent to the ramp a little better. And those are for trucks, of course. And they're, they also have a 50 mile per hour advisory with those. So there's one there. And then there's actually two more for drivers that are going to be going westbound. You can see the one there a little bit. And then the last photo is just prior to getting to the bridge that goes over 90 and where the curve starts. So next slide. And there's, you can probably click through about six of these at once to bring this data up. So, you know, what are, what are the important factors with this curve? Like I said before, the ADT is 10,000, 16% of that is trucks. There's no reduced speed posting. It's, it's 65, but like I said, we do let trucks know that 50 is probably more appropriate for them. And then this last one is interesting. You might look at 27 crashes in 20 years, and if you do the math, that's only one or two per year. That doesn't sound too bad, but 
what what happens is you know a good percentage of those crashes are large trucks large loaded trucks and when they crash it's pretty catastrophic next slide uh, okay that's just that was just an indication that most of the crashes happen when it's basically perfect weather um, so we can't blame it on weather or anything like that so this is what it typically looks like a truck going a little too fast around the curve rolls over a lot of cases they lose their load then they go through the guide rail you can see up ahead in the center picture that's where they ended up going through and then it's about a 40 foot drop 40 to 50 feet down this embankment and it's steep enough that they they typically end up at the bottom so that's that's what we're trying to stop from happening okay next slide so so we what do we want to do here we we decided you know the other devices that we had in place weren't weren't enough so um this this system by tapco was fairly new um we did a little research and thought that this might be the ticket for us uh, tapco they're a pretty big company they they um manufacture and sell lots of traffic control devices they seem to be on the leading edge of like um, electric devices flashing devices um, what you might call smart transportation type devices so and at the time that we were making this decision uh, they were the only company that was bulletin 15 approved for this type of uh, device next slide okay so the way we were fortunate uh, we happened to have a paving project that was in the queue for route 86 so we were able to add this device into that existing project um, just made made it a much easier install for us um, the description we wanted was uh, or that we made it was a 24 hour solar powered so there's there's options you can have as to when the uh, chevrons flash we just made the decision we wanted it full time 24 7 365 and of course it's a it's a dynamic curve warning system because you know it's a little more than just a static sign it's it's actually flashing so that's where that description comes in uh, and rather than bid it as uh, individual units we just lumped it all together uh, as a lump sum of unit consisting of seven chevrons and the size of them is 24 by 30. so the total bid price for that item was thirty seven thousand dollars or just over five thousand dollars each pretty modest uh, cost for you know the benefit that we were going to get out of it Next slide. Okay, so this this is the video. Um, before I start this, I I want to tell you that something I didn't really mention was as as you are coming into the curve, it's also at the same time that the uh, the view is opening up to Lake Erie. So if you look as it as I start this and it starts to zoom in a little bit, you'll be able to see Lake Erie. And you'll also be able to see on the left side of the um, screen Presque Isle sticking out into the lake and you can see the bay in between the mainland and Presque Isle but also <laughs> you know really what I want you to focus on folks is all the other devices we have in place to address this curve um, there's delineation on the guide rail there is slow curve warnings there's rpms um there's more delineation on the barrier that's here so we feel like it's it's well lit up and you'll see when we start playing this what it looks like
Now you can you can also notice there's five chevrons. Uh, this is where I got to come clean. Those pictures I showed you of a typical wreck, those happened uh, about two months ago. That, that crash happened two months ago. And that truck ended up wiping out the last two chevrons in this sequence. So when I took the video, we were still in the process of getting those replaced. But um, at least you get the idea. Um, I guess one thing I didn't mention also was this installation was completed about a year ago. So it was August or September timeframe. So we have a year, a year in with them and just have that one crash, but um, you know, it's it's that typical crash. It seems like we we may not have it figured out just just yet. We're very happy with the chevrons. There's there's no there's no question that uh, drivers are alerted to the curve. You, you start picking up on those flashing lights about a quarter mile before you ever get there. So if we go through our, our lessons learned. Um, so like I was saying, just, just having the chevrons there might not be enough. We still feel like we need something to get drivers to actually slow down. So, so we're considering, you know, maybe some more advanced signing to go in place. Um, we're kind of having those discussions right now. But, but I would say the, the chevrons do what we want them to do. Um, so it, it's, it's another tool for our toolbox. And with that, I think we can take some questions. Yes, thank you, Brian. All right, I'm checking here. Um, question, were any other treatments used prior to the lighted chevrons to address the crashes? So did you try anything in before that? Yes, what, what, we, what we had out there prior was static chevron signs. Um, and it, then at some point we upgraded and put a large static arrow board kind of midway between the chevrons. Um, and then we added some flashing wigwag lights above that large arrow board. And that was in place for quite a few years. Um, so then, then we decided, you know, maybe it'd be better to light all the chevrons and that's, that's how this all came together. Um, but something else we tried before this was uh, a technique called perceptual pavement markings. And those are, those are lines that go across the lane, kind of like a, uh, a stop bar. Um, they go across the lane and they, they progressively get closer together as you drive over them. So it gives the driver the feeling that maybe they're speeding up because those lines are getting closer and closer. So we, we tried that through one pavement cycle. Uh, didn't really seem to make any difference. Uh, so, so after that, we added some slow curve markings. And that's where we're at today. Thank you. Follow up question. Do the chevrons flash day and night? We, we have them on 24 seven. So they do. Um, I wish I had a video to show you of them during the day because they they are noticeable during the daylight too. Okay. Yes. Uh, was there any advanced signing reducing the speed or trying to reduce the speed? We haven't done that to this point. Um, mostly because, like I said, a car can drive that curve at 65 easily, and actually trucks probably can too. It's it's just that occasional truck that has a load shift that seems to be the problem. So we're you know we're not sure how to 
how to tackle that. But if, if we artificially lowered the speed limit, our feeling is it wouldn't make any difference. People are still going to drive what they feel comfortable. Thank you. Oh, one more came in. Can you use rumble strips approaching the curve? That's been talked about. Um, the, the thing with that is, you know, that that then involves. Well, the ADT is 10,000, so it's 5,000 in that direction. So every day you have 5,000 vehicles. That are, you know, going over that rumble strip. And 99.9% .9 of them don't need that. It's it's more of a you know inconvenience for them. And we we just don't feel that that alone is gonna make a difference. But but again, we we have talked about it. Thank you, Brian. Another question. Do you ever warn trucks about load shifting on an information sign? Uh, you know, going beyond the truck rollover signing that we have there. Uh, we haven't, but that that's a good suggestion. Um, I don't know if there's a standard sign for that, so that might be a special sign we could you know, look into possibly doing. Thank you, Brian. That's all the questions we have at this time for you. So I appreciate your time. Sure. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, uh, Chris. I'm actually, Brian, I do have a question for you. Um, I'm pretty sure if I understand correctly that we do see these being used um, at some locations, I believe in PennDOT District 10 as well as PennDOT District 11, if I'm correct. Um, do you know any plans to use them at other locations in your district or, or what are you aware of in terms of their use elsewhere across the state? Yeah, Danielle, I, I've seen the ones in District, uh, I think it's 10 uh, on I-80. So. Yeah, there, there's a few other examples. And the one in District 11 is a pretty big system, with my understanding, um, like 200 signs with that one. So yeah, under the right conditions, it's a great tool. Um, we don't have any other locations in our district that we're looking at just yet, but we know we've got you know something in our toolbox that. If an issue comes up, this this might just be what we need. Yeah, Brian, you're actually kind of summing up. I think the the theme for this week, uh, this virtual innovation week, is that these are just more tools in our toolbox, um, you know, to help us do our our jobs better, safer, faster, more efficiently. Um, we've just heard that as a common theme that hey, these tools are out there, and and where it makes sense to use them, you know, we're using them, we're looking to use them. So you summed it up perfectly there. Um, I'll go to Crystal Ann. Uh, do we have any anything more at this point, Crystal Ann, in the, the chat pod? Again, if you do have questions, uh, submit them now. We still have about 12 minutes left in this session. So, Crystal Ann, any additional questions? Yes. Um, for Pierce or Jeff, regarding the one map, we have a question here that came in uh, earlier. So, related to the one map, can the TISMO layers, symbols, and information be added as system maps, um, layers that are not confidential da data layers. I can, uh, uh, so. This is Jeff. I, I don't fully understand that question. Pierce, I don't know if you're there. You know more about the TISMA yeah, layer. Um, So are they trying to, I guess, it figure out what exactly part. So are the TISMOS PennDOT one maps presented in the slides saved maps that could be shared as layers, display symbols as presented, and set up as saved maps to review rather than making a new map for each user? 
And yeah, then- so uh, to answer that, the uh, there are system apps. You can uh, load them, uh, make whatever changes you want, and save as your own personal like uh, version of that map. Um, each of the the layers on those uh, system apps are are in the uh, the layer catalog. So if you're just interested in you know a specific layer on the maps, you can just load that from the layer catalog. All right, thank you for that. All right, we have another, uh, going back to Brian, uh, this is, I guess, a little more of a statement. District 10 has a series of lighted signs on US 119 North of Indiana, PA, and they're very effective. So sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. And I am caught up with the questions that have come in to date. I know we'll we'll kind of wait a little bit, maybe as, as Danielle closes, because sometimes they trickle in with a delay. Sure, thank you, uh, Crystal Ann. So just a couple of reminders for everyone on today's session. Well, first and foremost, I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Um, obviously, they're very busy and, and very um, uh, active uh, with a lot of things that they have going on right now. So I'd like to take this opportunity to say thank you to them uh, for putting their presentations together uh, for today's session. I'd like to thank all of our attendees. Just a reminder that we do have our virtual exhibit hall on our event website, www.pendot.gov forward slash innovations week. Um, we're going to keep that virtual exhibit hall out there um, for a while. So even into the, the coming weeks, uh, feel free to go and check that out. Uh, again, more than 50 innovations and smart practices uh, on display there. And again, we have that contact form. Uh, if you have any questions about a particular innovation or smart practice, uh, just uh, submit that contact form and we'll get you connected with the appropriate subject matter expert. Uh, again, um, we're going to make recordings of all of our virtual innovation uh, sessions uh, available with, on our event website within the next week's, week or so. The good news is uh, for this particular session, um, you'll be able to actually fast forward uh, through some of our little technical issues that we had today. So again, my, my thanks to all of you for sticking with us um, through that, um, but we are going to make the, the session recordings available. Again, technology is great when it works and sometimes when it doesn't, you know, certainly can be a little frustrating, but we made it through and, and our presenters did a fantastic job. Um, so I just want to go back to Crystal Ann real quick, just to see if we had any additional questions trickle in for our speakers. No, we are caught up. And complete. All right. Well, with that being said, uh, again, thanks to everybody for joining us today. Again, thanks to our, our presenters. Um, this actually concludes PennDOT's first ever virtual innovation week. And again, check out the event website, not only for the exhibit hall, but the recordings of all of our sessions here within the next week or so. We thank you all for joining us today. We hope you have a wonderful weekend. It looks like a beautiful weekend on tap across Pennsylvania. Um, so certainly enjoy and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle.